We are at the tail end of a, of a teaching series called Dirty Little Secrets, and, and we're going through some things that, we, that we've grown up either believing is true because that's what the world around us says, or maybe we say to ourselves, um, but maybe really aren't right on. So um, we've talked about the, the little lies sometimes we tell ourselves that we, I cannot change. Uh, last week we talked about you know the safest place to be is in the, in the center of the will of God. And we were like, uh, not the Bible I read. Um, and so if you're interested in any of that, you can always, if you miss those teachings, you can always go online um, to svtrinity.org and, and listen to those. Um, but this week's uh, Dirty Little Secret, I got, I got to share with you that I've, I'm guilty of um, using this one myself. Okay, So this, is, this would be a common scenario in the King household. right? It's, it's late one evening. And um, I have a child that begins to pray and say, you know, dear, dear God, dear Jesus, would you help me get a good grade in math? Right. And what I know is they haven't even done half their homework for math. <laughs> and in response to that, I, I it would not be unusual for me to kind of say to to my child, um, you know, God helps those who help themselves. In other words, it's great that you want a good grade in math and you want God to help you with that, but you need to do your homework. <laughs> common. It's a common saying. The problem is, is it's not really quite true. It's actually a dirty little secret. And it's a dirty little secret of the church. That's what even makes it worse. It's our own fault. We can't blame the world for this one. This is our own fault. So in your, in, if you got the little uh, bulletin when you came in, the worship folder, in it there's the notes or are, are the center sheet. You can kind of follow along. There's some fill in the blanks. But here's the lie. The lie is this. This is in your, in your notes. Uh, this popular model emphasizes the importance of self-initiative, and it suggests a spiritual self-reliance. It often incorporates the idea that you cannot depend solely on divine help, but you must work yourself to get what you want. It's a partnership. Makes sense, doesn't it? Um, the phrase is often mistaken as scriptural, but guess what? It appears nowhere in the Bible. Neither does, you know, godliness is next to cleanliness. It's not there either, though my mother used that one often. This, this, is, this is not, this, this little phrase is not in the, in the Bible. Um, and, and again, it sounds good. It sounds harmless. It sounds like you just can't sit on your hands. You need to get up and do something. And then, you know, God will help you out. And, and there may be a, some, a line of truth to that. But really, the, the core idea, it's actually off. And so, as always, we don't want to just say this is, this is the way it is. We want to go to God's word and, um, and see what it, what it has to say, and in this case, specifically, what Jesus had to say. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 15. If you don't, don't worry. There's a Bible in front of you. You can use that, or you can just listen, Whatever, whatever's good. If you grab one of our Bibles, it's page 764, 764. If you have your own Bible, that probably won't help you. You'll just have to go to John chapter 15. But our, um, our Bibles is page 764. The Bible is not actually write one book. It's a collection of 66 books written by authors from poor to rich, uh, all different classes, all different uh, backgrounds over, over literally thousands of years that all agree on one thing. And this particular writer, John, um, was one of the closest uh, friends and disciples of Jesus. He was with Jesus pretty much from his baptism all the way through his resurrection. So this is a firsthand account. And he spends a lot of time, Jesus, between the, what we call the Last uh, Supper, was a celebration of Passover, and his death on the cross, he's preparing his disciples for his leaving. And when he kind of hands it over to them to kind of walk in his footsteps. And John spends a lot of time um, with what did Jesus say and, and what did he encourage with them? And that's, and that's where we are. In John chapter 15, Jesus is encouraging and teaching his disciples. These are kind of like his last words. You know, you save the best for last. So there is really important. And so we pick up in, uh, in John chapter 15. 
You can imagine, I, I don't know if this is true. I do know that, that uh, this is between Jesus leaving Jerusalem in what we call the upper room, a house where they celebrated the dinner, and he's going to outside the city, up the hill to the Garden of Gethsemane. Somewhere between those two points, this discussion happens. It's likely, we don't know for sure, that he was actually walking through a vineyard, you know, where they grow uh, grapes, while he has this discussion. If not, they're completely familiar with this. And he draws off of this illustration, this is what he says. He says, I am the true vine, and my father, that's being God, is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will, it will be even more fruitful. Now this is a common, like I said, a common image uh, for them. They, they understand kind of where he's going uh, with this because they're familiar. I mean, this is an agricultural society. Most people work in agriculture and, and uh, understand what he's doing. But if you grow anything or you know somebody who, who grows anything, you're, you're familiar with this, okay? So the, the, the whole idea is, is if you go by, let's say, a vineyard in the, in the height of harvest season, you will see these wonderful leaves and the, and the grapes, and it just expands everywhere. It looks like this huge, huge bush. But when the growing season's done and the fruit's been harvested, what the gardener does, and this is God in this case, the gardener comes through and he cuts back all the branches. So when you go by, when it's not harvest season, and, and the, what you'll see is just these, this looks like a stick growing out of the ground. There's nothing there. There's another thing that the gardener does, and he goes through and he looks for what we call sucker branches. And what a sucker branch is, is it's not going to produce fruit, so you're a sucker if you leave it there. <laughs> I don't know if that's really the definition, but that's my definition. Okay? Uh, what it it looks like, uh, kind of looks like the other branches, but it's never going to produce fruit. But the, the problem is it's drawing strength from the vine so that the other good branches that will produce fruit aren't getting all the energy and all the nutrition and whatnot that they could because it's taken some of those resources. So a good gardener will go in and say, uh, this branch, this vine isn't going to produce anything and cut that off to make the other stuff healthy. But even the healthy stuff, like I said, a good gardener will go through and go, okay, it's the right season. I, I need to cut this off, right? If you have beautiful roses at home, you do what you call deadheading, right? Which means after it blooms and it starts losing, you cut it off so that it will stop absorbing life and, and more blooms will happen. And so he's drawing off of this illustration. He says, listen, guys, I am that vine. I, I, I am that stalk that's left. You are branches. Now, understand that God's the gardener, okay? And he's going to, anyone who's not going to produce fruit, who's not going to be useful for his kingdom, he's not going to waste, forget, he's cutting that off. But even if you are useful for the kingdom, God's going to prune you. That, that kind of goes back to last week's word, the safest place in, in the will of God is, or is to be in the will of God. Well, no, it's not really safe because God still prunes us. Life is still hard. So then he goes on, pick up in verse 3. You, you are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remember, Judas is already gone here. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. In other words, if you cut the branch off, it's, it's going to die. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Verse 5. I'm the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown in the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given. This is to my Father's glory, what? That you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So for those of you who've been around Trinity Church a, a while, you know that we are preoccupied with this word disciple. We want to be disciples, students, followers of Jesus. But in this day and time, to be someone's disciple wasn't just to be their student, to be their, their pupil. It meant, I want to be like this person, not only in what they know, but in what they do, their very character, their will. I want to cry when they cry. I want to laugh when they laugh. I want, basically, what they are from the inside out is what I want to be. And that's our, uh, that's our desire, is to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. But notice what he says. You kind of back up the truck in verse 8. This is what it means to be a disciple. First of all, what? My disciples bear fruit. 
You cannot be a disciple of his if you don't bear fruit. It goes back to verse 1 about the gardener coming in saying, if it's bearing fruit, it's a keeper. We'll still trim it, but it's a keeper. If it's not bearing fruit, it's not really mine in the first place. And notice if you back the truck up just a little bit more in verse 8, to be a disciple means to bear fruit. But to bear fruit means what? To bring glory to God. So if you want to know if you're a true disciple of Jesus Christ, what you do doesn't bring glory to you. It doesn't bring glory to your church or your family, or fill in the blank. It should bring glory to God. It should be evident to people as they look at your life, God's working in that person's life. It should bring glory to him. And so what we see here, especially in verse 4, he says, you've got to remain in me or else you can do nothing. And the nothing isn't obviously absolutely nothing because you can breathe without him. You can. Many of us live live our lives without God. But in terms of bearing fruit that bring glory to God, true transformation can't happen apart from him. And that brings us to the truth, which is God helps those who cannot help themselves. Notice here he doesn't say, hey, listen, if you want to be my disciple, go to church, read your Bible, obey the Ten Commandments. He says, if you, if you want to bear fruit, if you want to be my disciple... You must remain in me the life. You must gain your strength from me. Because if you don't gain your strength from me, if you're out on your own, you'll, you're dead and withered. Another verse, now you're going to want to mark this, so you can put a piece of paper in there, a bookmark, whatever, because we're going to come back to this. But Romans chapter 5, I want to go to Romans chapter 5 real quick. Again, if you have one of our Bibles, it's page 798. Page 798, but Romans chapter 5. If you're in John, Acts, and then Romans is the next book after that. Romans chapter 5. This is a letter that that Paul uh, uh, wrote to the folks in Rome. That's why it's called Romans. And uh, he's kind of laying out, you know, basically what he believes and what it means to be a Christian. Talks about the problem of sin and what Jesus did. And and in the beginning of chapter 5, it's really really cool because he says that now we have peace with God, not because of what we did, but because of what Jesus did for us. And to kind of exemplify this, he picks up in verse 6. We're going to go to verse 6. Again, we put in chapters and verses so we could find our way around. This was just a letter that he wrote. But in his letter, uh, chapter 5, verse 6, he says this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. See, what God did is he, he waited for a, a point in, and we said time, we talking about all time. And, and for God, time is simultaneous. If you, if you could picture it in your mind, God would like have his left foot at the beginning of time and his right foot at the end of time. And for him, it's instantaneous. And if your mind doesn't grasp that, then you're getting a clue of God. If your mind can grasp it, you don't got a clue what God's like. Okay. Because by definition, he wouldn't be a God. And so at just the right time, it says, when you were what? Powerless. That, that literally means weak. In other words, you could not do it yourself. God said, this is a good time. Notice it doesn't say, you know, when you finally got a clue and decided to do things right, then he. No. It says, when you were powerless and you were ungodly. In other words, you were like, God... Talk to the hand. God said, ooh, this is a good time. Can you believe that? Because I don't know about you, but when I go out to bless others, I wait for the hand to go down. Otherwise, you can just help yourself. He goes on and says, Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. No one likes a goody two-shoes, but someone who's basically good, they might lay their life down. But God's not, God's not like that. It says, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. You want to know how much God loved you, loves me, while we were still sinners, that's, that's like haters of God. It's the worst kind of word. Christ died for us. When we were powerless, we wanted nothing to do with him. At our worst moment, I don't know if it, I, I don't, maybe I don't want to take you there, but if you could picture the worst moment in your life, when, when you were, at, I mean, you would literally, if someone could see your heart, they would say, that is evil. If you pick that moment in time, 
God said, this is the perfect moment for me to show you that I love you. And I'm going to lay my life down. I'm, I'm going to submit my glory. I'm going to give it up to live in, in be confined in human flesh and, and be treated like a servant, be punished like a criminal, and die at that moment in time, at your worst, when you were powerless and you wanted nothing to do with me. It's, so you know how much I love you. And, by the way, so you know, it doesn't depend on you. Because it's for his glory. Let me, let me kind of give you an example of, of what I, a modern day example, if you would, of, of what I'm talking about. Um, one of the, the most successful programs uh, to date that help people who realize, man, I'm, I'm done for. I'm powerless. My life's being is uncontrollable, unmanageable, and is destroyed. That helps them get over the threshold and, be, and begin to experience uh, change is the Anonymous program. Alcohol Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, Shopping Anonymous, whatever it may be. It's, it's, it is one of the most, it is one of the most effective worldwide, unprofessionally led programs of all time. And, and if you know anything about the history, you'll, you'll know that, that uh, um, Dr. Bob and, and his friend started with the scriptures, started with a problem, went to the scriptures, and they developed some principles, which then later came out to 12 steps on what it means to move from powerlessness to a changed life. And they laid it out, like I said, in the 12 steps. And I just want to quickly, as an example, show you, it's interesting when they lay out these 12 steps, what's there, but it's even more interesting what's not there. Okay? So I, um, they'll come up on the screen here. Step one is, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction and that our lives had become unmanageable. Notice that the first step is, I can't do it. I don't know about you, but if, if, if I go in for help, I kind of want to, the, I would expect them to say, you know, repeat after me. I can conquer this. I rule. I am strong enough. That's what I expect them to say. I don't expect them to say, hey, you want help? Yeah. Well, then admit that you can't do it. <laughs> what? Step two, then, is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So not only do you have to understand that you're powerless, but you, you must come to understanding that something greater than you has more power. Step number three, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood. Not only do you have to understand about that power, but you actually have to turn your life over to it. Make, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. I call this understand that you're broken. Because you kind of go into this and say, I'm powerless. But, but if, if you've ever struggled, you've all struggled. When you are honest with yourself and you struggle with whatever it is that rules your life, your understanding of that is only a tip of the iceberg of how deep it really goes. And part of searching a moral inventory isn't like, how bad am I? It's, it's really coming to understanding, I am really sick. I've been deceiving myself for a long time. Five, admit to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. And again, this isn't a shame on you thing. This is a coming to realization of just, just how powerless I am. That's the point. It isn't a, it's a, I'm broken, and I really, I thought I needed help. I really need help. I'm really broken. Then we humbly ask God to remove those shortcomings. Because again, it can't be us. It's got to be him. Verse 8, or no, verse 8, step 8, sorry. <laughs> Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And again, that's the process of understanding that it, that it did affect others. It, 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 you know, we we'd say this lie as long, you know, I'm not really hurting anyone else. I'm just hurting myself. But when you become honest you realize that that selfishness, you realize that that addiction, you realize that that whatever it was had ripple effects in your relationships and how you worked and how you parented uh, throughout life. 
may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Step 10, continue to take personal inventory, and when we were wrong, promptly admit it. Understand that this isn't a one-time process, but you continue to understand, I'm broken. I need to be fixed. Step 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood God, praying only for knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. And finally, step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to other addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. You, you, you know what is interesting to me? That the focus of the 12 steps isn't on alcoholism or drug addiction. I mean, I don't know about you, but if I was writing 12 steps for something, let's, let's just take alcoholism. Somewhere in there, I would say, stop drinking. <laughs> just makes sense, doesn't it? At, at some point, when you just say, you know, stop doing what it is you're doing, put on, you know, pull up your bootstraps and be a man, be a woman, and get it done. It, 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 it just makes sense to me that that's, I mean, every how-to book I read, somewhere along the line, says to do that. And yet here, is, here it, doesn't, it doesn't once say, stop. What does it say? It says, admit you can't, and there's one who can, and seek him. Amen. I mean, what's, what's interesting to me is even, even as, you, as you work through the steps, right, the last, the last three or so steps, what are they all about? They're about reconnecting with God. It's, if you want to stay clean, if you want to stay sober, if you want to stay skinny, if you want to stay unselfish, what do you do? You don't go back and think, try really hard to white knuckle it. What do you do? You seek God continually. You seek to connect with him. And that's exactly what right back in John 15 it says. Again, okay, I'm going back to John 15 now. In John 15... Verse 5, it says here, we already read this. It says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I uh, in him, he will, being the disciple, bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is about to leave his disciples, and they're going to run into a whole bunch of stuff. And his best advice he can give them is this. Listen, when life happens and it's pressuring you, this is what I want you to do. Say so many Hail Marys. Uh, go to church every set. No, what does he say? Connect with me. Connect with me. Because apart from me, you are powerless. There is no life. If you want to truly live, you want to truly be a conqueror, connect to me. Our part is to abide. That's our part, is to abide, is to rest and seek him and his power and his strength. And that's what people all over the world are finding. It's not when I all of a sudden get the right morals. It's not when I all of a sudden even get the right understanding of the Bible. Though those things are important things. But it's when I understand that I am powerless, which is what the Bible reveals, and I go to God and I go, okay, let's just spend time. That his power flows in me. That life flows in me and does in me what I could not do Myself. Our part is to abide. Now, I want to take, if you would, a small commercial break here, okay? Uh, this is on the back of your, of your notes here. Uh, John Ortberg wrote a book called An Ordinary Day with Jesus. And in this, what he talked about is that, is that people who want to connect with God, God connect with him in different ways. We don't, we're not all connecting in the same way. So when I say to abide, for many of you, if you're raised in the church, you think of either going to church or doing your daily Bible study. And those, by the way, are two great things. But that's not the only way that people connect with God. And for some, for some of you, that may not be the best way to connect with God. And so he lists several things. I'm just going to go through these real quick. There's the, there is the intellectual pathway in terms of abiding. That's where you draw close to God as you learn more about him. This is the person that, you know, when you say we're going to read such and such chapter, not only do they read such and such chapter, but they read five books on that verse, and they come back with all this information, and they just, they're just thirsty. It's just like, give me more, 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 more. They're connecting with God by learning, and that's great, but not everyone connects with him that way. There's also the relational pathway. These folks have a deep sense of God's presence when they're involved in significant relationships. Yeah, it was fine. I learned something. 
But uh, when I did my study during the week and whatnot, from God's word, but what really, when I really feel connected with God is when we get together as community and I hear what God did in your life and I get to share and, and we talk about it and that's really how I connect. For others, it's a serving pathway. You know, it's great to learn and I love hanging out with people, but I experience God most when I'm doing what Jesus told us to do and serving and laying down my, my life. And it's, it's when I'm fixing something or when I'm greeting people as they come in or, or I'm, I'm an usher or I, or I serve at the YMCA or back at the Gateway Building in our boxing program or whatever it is. That's when they feel closest to God, when they're serving. For others, it's the worship pathway. They have a natural gift for expression and celebration. Some of us, you know, you may sit here and you're just like, yeah, worship is great, the singing and, and all that. And then you look around and you're like, man, those people are really into it. Their hands are up and they're waving their eyes are. And, and when they say, my heart is yours, they're like doing this. And, you know, and, 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 and you, it doesn't connect for you as much, and which is fine. That, that's a person that could very well worship be their, their, one of their pathways to God that most brings them brings them um, to, uh, into the throne room, into, into God's presence. Others is activist pathway. I'm kind of like this. You have a passion act. It's great that we talked about it. It's great that we know the truth. But if you don't do something, I, I, it's just not real to me. It's just not real to me. That's why I had a hard time in schools because, like, we, you know, great information. But what, what does it matter unless we can use it? And, and for some of us, you, you, it's using it. Um, you know, the interesting thing for me is I learn a lot when I'm studying the scriptures throughout the week, and I, I try to come prepared and ready to talk, but I usually learn more and the best while I'm teaching. I, I, uh, honestly, sometimes I'll leave a message and go, wow, God, I didn't know that. <laughs> I know it's scary, isn't it? <laughs> but it's, it, for me, it's that process of activating it and sharing it that, that I feel closer to God than even all the hours I spent studying God's word and trying to figure it out during the week. For other people, it's a contemplative pathway. Is God is most present to you when distractions and noises are removed. These are the folks who like to get away and meditate and, and just be, be quiet before the Lord. And the creation pathway, they have a passion ability to connect with God when they're experiencing the world he made. Getting out in nature, you can just really feel, you know, camping and you, know, you really, really feel close to him. Now, I want to make a couple observations here, okay? First, I want to say is, for some of you, you may be feeling distant from God because um, you're trying to do what somebody, uh, how somebody else, you know, maybe you have a mentor or somebody that says, I connect to God this way. And so you do that, but you're not feeding your soul where, it, where what you really connect with God. So for instance, let's say creations, part of it is connecting with God's creation, and you always do your quiet time or whatnot, you know, at home or in the office in the busyness of this world and concrete and walls, and you don't, you're not getting out in creation. Well, no wonder you don't feel as close to God. But I must also say this, just because you're 10 towards one doesn't mean you are off the hook with everything else. So it's like, if, again, if, uh, if uh, worship is yours, it's great that you sing praises to God. But if you never read his word, right, then how, how are you going to be informed enough to know what to sing? All right? And so even though you may, you may major in one or two or three of these, that doesn't mean you're, you don't, we don't practice all of them. I, it's tough for me to get alone and be quiet. But as I grow spiritually, I make time to do that more and more. And, and grow, in, uh, grow in those uh, things. Of course, I got to come back and be active about it after that's done. So last thing on this, okay? Um, I, um, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to, and you're thankful for that, I'm sure. Um, out in the lobby here on a couple tables, there is a, a um, John Ortberg, he's the genius behind this, put together a, um, like a diagnostic where you can go through and read this stuff and you say, and yeah, this is kind of me, this is definitely me, and it will help you identify which of these are your strengths, which where you really connect to God. If you're interested in that, you can pick it up, okay? It's, it's just sitting there as a handout. It's free. Just, just grab it, all right? Now, one last thing. This doesn't mean you don't have anything to do, especially if you're an activist like me. Some of you right now, you're shifting in your seat a little bit. Your mind's going buzzing like, now, hold on. People just can't do nothing, right? You know, you're right. You're right. There's plenty for us to do. And so I want to go a little bit further in John 15 and just read verses 9 and 10. Here, right? We did 1 through 8. Verse 9 says this. It says, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. 
In other words, as, as God is related to me, notice this is relational, you guys. This is the way I've related to you. Now, remain in my love, just like he remained in the Father's love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. In other words, if you, if you, what does it mean for you to love me? It means to obey my commands. As I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. Now, some of you, and I would be one of these people, would go, aha, I knew it. Obey his commands. You've you got to do those things. But I would, I would caution you and say, now, wait, wait, wait. What's the context where he says obey my commands? What is it that he just commanded them to do? Abide and love. He didn't command them to follow the Ten Commandments. He didn't command them to whatever list that you like. He, what, what he, the command that he's talking about is abiding. The command he's talking about is loving, loving God and loving each other. He says, there is something for you, for you to do. All right, so here's, here's the, not God helps those who help themselves, okay? God helps those who, get this, trust him. God helps those who trust him. If you read the Bible, that is what you will find. A lot of people did a lot of things in the Bible, but ultimately, if you look behind what they did, you will see it wasn't what they did that God blessed them. It's that they trusted him. And God does, if you want to get a clear picture of what this looks like, just like I said, go, oops, pick a story in the Bible and look at it. And what you'll see is this. For instance, God wants to help Israel get into Jericho. And, and when Joshua stands before him, he doesn't say to them, sharpen your spears, here's a good battle plan. What does he say? March around the city seven times. Huh? <laughs> That's kind of like if you want to get in recovery, just admit you can't do it. It's like, what? Why do they march around the city? Was that a good battle plan? No, it was a terrible battle plan. But what was God ultimately asking them to do? Trust me. If you march around the city seven times, what you're saying is, I trust you, God. Now, by the way, most of the time, they went and just did a normal battle plan. But before they did that, God said, ultimately, do you trust me? Do you trust me? And if you look at, at all these stories, you know, God could have led the Israelites anywhere. But what does he do? He leads them to a, to a part of the Red Sea they can't get across. And the armies come, and Moses gets down on his knees and says, God, what do we do now? And God's like, get off your knees. Go put that staff in the water. The water's part. Why? Could he, could he have easily taken them somewhere, and, and, and they would not have been chased down by the Israelites? Of course, but that wasn't the issue. The issue wasn't them to get to safety. The issue was, do you trust me? Let me give it just a quick modern day example. You are looking for a job. You're in the, in the economy. Of course, it's getting a little bit better, but it's not great for everybody. And you go before God and, and you say, God, I need a job. Will you give me a job? Now, here's the natural thing. We're expecting God to divinely say, go put an application in here. We're expecting God to say, you know, go and use this service or whatever. And sometimes God leads you that way. I'm not saying he doesn't. But a lot of times this is what God does. He says, you, you know, in your, in your eight-hour day, I want you to give up during this period, you don't have a job, I want you to give up two hours a day and tutor. That's what God does. You want me to answer your prayer? Yeah. His question isn't, well, then do it this way. His question is, do you trust me? And, and so what you do is you're like, it doesn't make any sense. I should be looking for a job. I should be beating the streets. What am I doing tutoring? I'm trusting God. Now, be careful of bravado where you try to be spiritual and do it when God hasn't called you to do it. But if God calls you to do it, and that's the way it works, that is the main issue, that you and I trust him. That's the weird thing about the gospel, the good news of what Jesus did. See, what we expect is that Jesus is like every good man. What does a good religious man come and do? He comes and he lives a, a, a truly spiritual life that the God of whatever gods, it makes sense that you should live. And then he turns to you and says, do the same. Serve the way I serve. Love the way I love. Give to the poor like I gave to the poor. Meditate the way I meditate. And, and that makes sense to us, right? It would be like going, what would make sense is I go to an AA meeting and someone says, listen, if you want to stop drinking, this is how you do it. You eat the breakfast I eat. You go to the places I go. Just mimic me and you will stop being an alcoholic. 
or a drug addict or whatever. But that's not the good news. The good news is this. God looks at us and goes, you're pathetic. <laughs> There's no hope for you. First step is, do you agree with me? <laughs> and he's just waiting for that. He's waiting for us to, just, to, to, to basically say, yeah, my life is unmanageable. I am pathetic. <laughs> and then he, and then he, and then, then, he, then he kind of flips and says, okay, do you believe that I can change it? Do you believe that I can do in your life what you cannot do yourself? And he'll take the little. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot. He'll take the little. And you just take the one step and say, you know, show up at the meeting. Or, or make the confession to a friend or whatever it may be. He'll take the one step and say, good, faith, let's go from there. And then his power begins to change us. So that when we come out the other end, we, we don't say, look, I stopped drinking. Look, I lost the weight. Look, uh, I did this for my family. When we come out the other end, we go, God was so gracious to me. That's the good news. Because God did for me what I cannot do for myself. We'll get to see a, a personal example of this here in a little bit. But let's take some time and get our hearts right before God. Let me pray for us. Dear Father, I thank you for that kind of love, Lord. I thank you for the kind of love that, that says, no matter how much you hated me, no matter how much you don't want anything to do with me, I'll lay my life down for you because I love you that much. We thank you for that. And I just pray for each person here today, dear God, um, as, we, as we all are still kind of shaking our fists, whether we are followers of Jesus or not, I just pray that you can just continue to work on that, on that heart. And even now, as we, as we sing unto you and we ask that you, you take the preeminent spot in our heart, you do for us what we cannot do ourselves, would you work that miracle in us? Help us let go a little bit more of self and experience a little bit more of you. I pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've actually been baptized before when I was about eight years old. I accepted Christ as my Savior when I was 12, then drifted away from him through high school and college. I rededicated my life to God when I was 25. I've spent the last 18 years learning what it means to be a Christian. Now, some of you may have noticed that I said I was baptized before I got saved. Normally, you accept Christ as your Savior first and then publicly declare your commitment to him by getting baptized, and I'd done it backward. I never noticed these events were out of order until three years ago when I tried to become a member at Trinity. During the membership meeting, after I had shared my testimony, one of the elders pointed out this discrepancy. Don't worry about it, he said. It's just a technicality. You have a testimony. We can set up a baptism for you next week. And as soon as he said that, I knew I couldn't do it. There was too much in my life that I wasn't willing to give up, and I knew that if I allowed myself to be baptized that way, I'd be lying to everyone who witnessed it. So I made excuses for not being available, and the elders followed up later, and I had more excuses for not being available. And finally, they dropped it. I spent the rest of 2010 avoiding God. In fact, I had started running away several months earlier. One night in our home fellowship group, I had watched my husband submit his life to Christ, not just as his Savior, but as his Lord. As he got down on his knees and asked the group to pray for him to be fully committed, everyone else circled around and I literally backed away. I didn't want anything to do with that kind of a relationship with God, and even though I was proud of Dean and grateful he had taken that step, I was overwhelmed with fear that God would require the same commitment of me. I didn't believe God was good, or that I could trust him, or that he had my best interests in mind. I felt like I had done a pretty good job of building my own life, for the most part, and I didn't want to give up control of that in exchange for a relationship with him. Certainly not the kind of relationship that Dean had signed up for. Later that summer, our home fellowship leader spent a few months mentoring me through a difficult event, and she identified those beliefs of mine as a stronghold. She helped me realize that I didn't understand God's character and, and I was operating under false assumptions. I was willing to accept that could be true, that I could be wrong about God, but I wasn't ready to give up my defenses. The risk was too great. I had learned at a young age that authority figures weren't dependable, 
that I could only count on myself to take care of me and that needing anyone only led to disappointment and pain. I didn't expect God to be any different and I wasn't interested in testing that theory. In fact, I was so motivated to avoid the pain of relationships that I kept everyone at a distance, my husband, my family, and especially God, because I was certain that loving anyone or allowing anyone to love me would just end in heartbreak. Discussing this stronghold with our home fellowship leader increased my awareness of the trap I was in. I had built a very small foxhole to protect myself against the world, and it was starting to hurt me. As I realized the cost of my choices, my fear of relationships was suddenly overshadowed by a greater fear that I could actually choose to live in emotional isolation forever, and God might just give me what I wanted. In my desperation, I offered him one simple prayer, please don't leave me in this box. And I prayed that for the next nine months. The following spring in 2011, I had the opportunity to volunteer in Sparklers, our Sunday school class for two to three year olds, and God used those children to minister to me. I call it my year of Play-Doh therapy. <laughs> I learned to enjoy and trust and form relationships with the most innocent people at our church. Believe it or not, my defenses were so high that I was even afraid to let toddlers in. During this time, I also had a chance to observe how the Sunday school teacher played with and comforted and taught the children. I knew this was a model for how God wanted to relate to me, but I still kept my, dis my distance from him. Later that year, while I was still learning how to relate in Sparklers, I also joined a women's small group that brought challenges of its own. The group leader was adamant about teaching God's goodness and helping us understand his character. Still, I resisted. But she was persistent, and over the next year, I began to trust her and believe that she, at least, was motivated by love and had my best interests in mind. She constantly encouraged me to take small steps toward God and to identify areas in my life where he was demonstrating his care for me, despite my reluctance to see it. By 2012, I knew God was working on getting me out of that box, even as I fought to stay in it. One Sunday morning, Pastor Joel showed us a picture of two thrones and I knew I had chosen, and was still choosing, the self-directed life, even though God wanted to direct my life. One night, during a Wednesday evening class, Joel taught on John 12, 24, truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And I knew God was calling me to die to myself, but I was still too afraid to let go. Then in December, Pastor Avery preached on Peter getting out of the boat, and he challenged us to identify the one thing we could let go of this year so that next year we could claim a victory over that thing. And I knew my one thing was me. I had to let go of me, my self-protection and control, my no, and my independence from God. I wasn't ready, but I offered up another simple prayer. Help me give up my I am. Help me give up being the God of my own life. And I've been praying that for several months now. This year, I started reading, again, a book the Sunday School teacher from Sparklers had given me called A Thousand Gifts. The author claimed that she had said yes to God with her mouth, but no to God with her life. And I knew I was doing the same. And I was tired of it. I wanted to change. As I thought about the events that occurred over the last three years, I realized that God had been teaching me to surrender along the way. He put people in my life, you all, to be my friends, to guide me and to love me. And every time I let one of you in, I let in a little bit of God also. And it was good. Slowly, he has given me the desire for real life and real relationship. And I have learned to accept these things as gifts instead of pushing them aside as threats to my safety. I have learned to trust you, and through that, I have learned to trust him, and he has given me the courage to give up the rest of my defenses. So I'm choosing to get out of the boat and to give my whole heart to God. I'm still afraid, but I believe that if I let go of my independence and self-sufficiency, that he will make my life into something better than the life I've made for myself. I 
I've asked my husband to baptize me. In the same way that I've held back from God, I've also held back from my husband. And if I'm going to submit to God, then I want to submit to my husband as well. And I wanted to show him that with my life, not just with my words. And I've asked Karen Miller to be in the water with me because she has personally shepherded me for the last two years of this journey. She challenged me to look at the truth of God even when I didn't want to see it. Even when I threatened to run away, her sincere belief in God's goodness and her transparent nature convinced me to trust her in spite of my fears. I have allowed her to love me and I've been blessed because of it. Thank you.